Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's Sunday School lesson. It's our second lesson on Jude, and we're going to be in verses 5 through 10. But before we get, before we jump into it, please join me as we open in prayer. Father, we thank you for this book of Jude. We thank you for the words that are written there. We know that you protected them, that they're your words. Father, may you use these words to change us, to make us more like you and less like our world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. This this lesson that we're going to explore this morning is a lesson in verses 5 through 10. And as I said, it's a lesson on the God of love and judgment. We often hear about God's love, but we often don't hear a lot about his judgment. Well, here in these five verses, Jude is going to really examine the idea of judgment when it comes to God. But before we do that, let's jump into this word of judgment, because we see it a lot today. We see it out in our culture. It's, we seem to be living in a time where everybody judges everybody else. And judgment is thrown all over the place. So what does it mean? What is this idea of judgment? Well, if you look up the, def the definition for the word in any dictionary, you're going to find three prominent definitions. The first is going to go something like this. It's a process of forming an opinion or an evaluation by discernment and comparison. The second is going to say it's an opinion or an estimate that is formed. And the third is going to say something around the nature of a formal utterance of an authoritative opinion. The idea of judgment is it's the, it comes at the end of a process of discernment. And this idea of discernment rests in who you are, what you value, what your belief system is, the way you look at the world. So those of us in Christ, I hope our discernment rests in who Jesus is and what we see in the scriptures and how we are to worship him in body with other believers in truth and in spirit. And so hopefully our judgment is really God's judgment through us. You know, we're warned not to judge, and we'll examine that verse in a minute. But those not in Christ, what is their judgment? Well, again, their process of discernment is going to be rooted in what they value, what they believe, the way they view the world. And so their judgment is generally going to be inconsistent. There's not going to be, it's going to be a situational judgment, kind of like a situational ethics. And I think that's what we see out there in the world today. And we, we shake our heads and are confused by it, but Jude's going to kind of explain it a little bit to us today. Now, what, is, what does Scripture say about judgment? Well, if you look at Paul in Corinthians, he reminds us, he says, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Those of us in Christ know that when we sit before God and are judged, it is not our, our um, record that's going to be judged. It's Christ's record in us, right? Because we know God's a holy God. He's a righteous God, and he rejects us just for one sin, but because we are in Christ, it is Christ's perfect record, sinless and spotless life that is submitted instead of our record. Those of us not in Christ, they will be judged according to their record. And we know that that one sin will disqualify them. But we also see what Jesus says about judgment in Matthew. He says, judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured on you. This verse is a direct reference to what I just talked about, is that if you judge according to your own merits, according to your own ideas and logic, then you will be judged according to your own merits, your own ideas, and your own logic. But if you judge in accordance with the Holy God, and he is judging through you, then it is, that is how you will be judged at the end, according to Christ. Uh, the idea of judgment is, for the believer, something that we have to pay particularly close attention to. Um, our pride makes us want to judge. Our selfishness makes us want to judge. But as a Christian, we should be selfless and we should be humble and we should submit to the authority over us. And therefore, judgment should be something that we do very carefully and very cautiously. Jesus tells us again, he tells us on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word that they speak. In other words, God is a holy and righteous God and every word, deed, action will be judged according to his standards. You're covered if Christ is your record. But if Christ is not your record, then that is the standard of judgment that awaits you at the end of your days. So Jude is going to talk about the God of judgment in these next five verses. What, he, what Jude did up in, in the first four verses that we examined yet last week was he talked about how beloved we are in Christ. And we talked about the fact that um, we are kept by God for Christ. And he was encouraging. But instead of drilling down in those areas, Jude pivots and goes in a different direction. Because Jude also talks about the false teachers. And he talks about the threat of the false teaching 
in regards to the church. And so what Jude does is in this passage, he exposes the reader to five, four fates that await those false teachers, four fates that await those who are heretical and pushing people away from God. And we're going to examine those four fates. But before we do that, let's read the passage. I think it's always healthy and helpful to read scripture out loud. So I'm going to do that. I put the passage up for you to read as well. Let's start in verse 5. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels who did stay within their own position of authority, but left the proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains until the gloomy darkness. I'm sorry, under the gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people, also relying on their dreams, defile the flesh, reject authority, and blasphemy the glorious ones. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce blasphemous judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. So here we see in this passage a lot to unpack. There's a lot there. And we're not going to do it justice in the short time that we're going to explore it today, but we're hopefully going to hit the main points, according to Jude. What Jude does not want us to miss is the general idea of who God, of who God is in his totality. He is the God of love, but he's also the God of judgment. Uh, one commentator put it this way, Jude verses 5 through 10 shatter the belief in a God who acts in love without judgment. He is a perfect God who acts in judgment out of his righteousness. This is a reminder that this is God too. Even though we read about God and his love, this also is God. Jude urges believers to, in the first four verses we, we uh, addressed last week, he urged us to persevere and contend for the faith. But instead of getting into the details on how to do that, again, I said, as I said earlier, he pivots and addresses the idea of false teaching because he considered it a threat to the church at large. So let's begin. Let's look at the four fates that Jude addresses in this passage. We're going to start with fate one, which is earthly destruction. Jude reminds us that though Jesus saved the people out of Egypt, he later destroyed those who did not believe. This is a direct reference to the Exodus and the wandering in the wilderness of the Israelites. In Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 34 through 40, it reminds us that God pulled, saved his people from Egypt. He pulled them out of Egypt from the stronghold of the Egyptians and into a wandering in the wilderness, preparing them for the Holy Land. But we also see in this uh, one verse in this passage tells us a little bit about God's view of what's going on in, um, in the, the camp of the Israelites as they are wandering in the wilderness. He says this, he says, Not one of these men, this evil generation, shall see, shall see the good land which I, I swore to give your fathers. Did not God save them from the land of Egypt? Of course he did. It was a physical salvation. He saved them from oppression and slavery. But what else is going on here? Calvin says the Hebrews here were saved and liberated by God from the Egyptians, but not all of them feared him. As a matter of fact, quite a few did not fear him. Many of them, according to Calvin, did not experience the spiritual salvation or the saving faith necessary for eternal life with God. So what was the result? They were destroyed. Remember, it says, Jesus who saved the people out of the land of Egypt afterward destroyed those who did not believe. This too is God. He is perfect as we reference. He cannot look upon one sin in any form. So if you do not rest in him and trust him for your salvation, then you are left with your own, your own merits, your own ideas, and your own consequences. And what God is saying here, what Jude is saying here, is you are left with one fate, destruction. Remember Acts 4.12 says this, it says, salvation is found in no one else but the capstone. Jesus is the only salvation out there. He is the only pathway to God. All others fall short. We see here that God is indeed a God of love, but he's also a God who is holy. And by holy, he cannot look upon one sin. If, he, if you do not rest in his son, then you are judged on your own merits and your future is destruction. One commentator said this, judgment is the combination of holiness and love mixed with grace. 
who can judge rightly but a holy God? Because judgment should be holy. It should be righteous. And who can judge that way but the one who is holy and the one who is righteous? Again, this reminds us of the warning presented to us in Matthew 7. Judgment is reserved for a holy God. Right judgment, righteous judgment, and holy judgment can only be found in one place. That is God. We who are created by God cannot rest in our own merits and cannot judge according to who we are. We must judge according to who God is. And so those of us in Christ, we're not prideful and arrogant and judgmental. We're humble and servant-oriented and selfless, and we judge carefully and cautiously. Okay, so fate one for the false teachers of Jude's day. Jude referenced their fate is an earthly destruction. Fate two is a heavenly rejection. Jude moves from this earthly realm to the heavenly realm, and he references this in verses six and seven when he says, the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left the proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under the gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. So what do we see here? We see a heavenly rejection by God. We see God is God and there is no other. We also see that God is the God of heaven and earth, and against him there is no foe. He is all-powerful, almighty. This is the reality, and no one can change it. But this reality should move us in Christ to an awe and a fear and a respect of who God is. We should want more of him and not less of him. While he is the God of judgment and wrath for those who don't know him, he is the God of love and grace for those who do know him and walk with his son. We see that there was a proper dwelling for the angels, but they decided to leave it we see that it was their choice. It was their action and their consequences. And the fact is, those consequences are all theirs. There are various other views regarding these angels referenced, but the consensus in, is that in Jude, he is referencing the angels that rebelled against God with Satan. These are the same angels referenced in Revelation 12, 4 through 8. And notice Jude refers to them as the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority and left their proper dwelling. In other words, God gave them positions of authority. He gave them proper dwellings, and they chose to give up both to seek what they could get for themselves. Isn't that often the case with those who don't know Christ? Don't they often think that they know better than God? Don't they often discard what is a proper dwelling, what is a position of authority, because they think they can get more? That's, that's, a, that's an earthly response to a holy God. Notice what happened to them. God has kept them in chains under the gloomy darkness until judgment day. This is a reference to God's authority and power. So if angels have no power over God, including the ones that rebelled against him, what makes us think we have any? Ephesians 6.12 calls these angels rulers of darkness of this world. And that's their, that's their future. They are doomed to this world. They left heaven. They have no eternal future with God. They are chained and they will be doomed to this world forever and cast out of heaven to be eternally separated from a holy God. They will be rejected by that holy God. So here we have fate one, earthly destruction, fate two, heavenly rejection, and now we go to fate three, Sodom and Gomorrah. This example is given to the reader by Jude through the idea of what's presented in the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Jude no doubt referenced the story because of its popularity. Now, the reference to miss, not to miss in this story is that of sin and the choice of sin. Um, for me, I like to look at the general idea of sin because sin is sin. Whether you're a liar, a um, thief, whether you take the Lord's name in vain, whether you murder somebody, sin is sin. And by choosing sin, you are choosing to not choose God. So even though the focus of this story is in the area of sexual sin, we need not to miss the issue of sin here. The point in Sodom and Gomorrah is that those residents of those two cities refused to give up their sin for the Lord. They chose their sin over God repeatedly, time after time. And for that, they experienced the judgment and wrath of God immediately. So we see uh, God gave them multiple opportunities, multiple chances to choose him. And what did they do every time? They chose their sin. They chose their selfishness. They chose their pride. Jude goes on to reference in verse 8, three doorways to sin. He says, yet in the same way, these men also by dreaming 
In other words, he's referencing the sensuality he referenced earlier. By dreaming, they defile the flesh, reject authority, and blasphemy the glorious ones. The issue, again, is not the nature of the sin, but the choice of the sin. When, when Jude says they defile the flesh, to defile is to dishonor, to sully, to corrupt that which God made. God made beings as created beings. He gave them flesh and blood and he gave them breath. They are not to be worshipped, but they are created beings to worship him. Defiling that is defiling what God made and calling it God. He also says they rejected authority. To reject is to spurn and scorn the authority which God has placed over you. We know we're called to submit to authority. And sometimes the authority is godly, but sometimes it's not. But we are still called to submit to that authority because God ultimately is in control. And then these, these men of Sodom and Gomorrah, they blasphemy the glorious ones. The angels came offering them salvation one more time, offering them one more opportunity to choose God, and they cursed them. They reviled them, they disparaged them, and they insulted them. To devile and reject and blaspheme the things of God is to intentionally choose sin instead of God. These are three actions that go well beyond the superficial nature of the sin, and they drill down into the deeper issue of pride and abuse. Isn't that where we find our sin most of the time? We think too highly of ourselves, we're prideful, or we abuse what God has given us because we want more. Both these cities were examples of these very things. They were amoral, and the result was immediate vengeance of God by fire. They were to be examples to all of us of God and his wrath to those who don't choose him. He is the God of love, but he is also one of wrath and judgment for those who choose sin over him. So we have three fates so far. Our fourth is the fate of superstitious isolation. This, these verses are a bit more complex. Ju, ju, I'm sorry, Jude references the name of Michael for one reason, to address this idea of superstition. But when the archangel Michael contended with the devil, he was disputing about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce blasphemous judgment, but said, the Lord rebuke you, but these people blasphemy all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Calvin wrote, Regarding this passage, he says, It's beyond controversy that Moses was buried by the Lord. That is, that is, his grave was concealed according to the known purposes of God. And the reason for concealing his grave is evident to all. That is, that the Jews might not bring forth his body to promote superstition. I would say this is the idea of man-made religion over faith. Man is always the author of man-made religion. God is the author of faith. And do we not see this today in our current culture? If you understand Orthodox Jewish tradition, you understand that they worship Moses in a, better, in a different way than most other prophets. And the first five books of the Bible are the only books of the Bible for the Orthodox Jews. And Moses, being the author of those five books, is certainly elevated beyond what he should be elevated, almost to the status of Christ. We see this. We see this idea of man-made religion over faith. And this is what... Um, Jude is referencing. Now, this, this last sentence here is really an important one for us to understand. But these people blasphemy all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand. In other words, they insult and reject that which they do not understand to declare themselves prideful, better, more intelligent. But what they are also ultimately doing is acting like animals on instinct. Isn't that the way Satan always tempts us? Doesn't he always tempt us to, to, to uh, default to our feelings and not the truth that we know? He tempts us to make idols of those saints who have done wonderful things for God, pulling us away from our faith and pushing us toward this man-made religion. Jude here references that these people blasphemed all that they do not understand. Calvin wrote about it this way. He said, these people have no taste for anything. If they're operating on only their instincts, acting, unre acting like unreasoning animals, then he says they have no taste for anything but only what was gross, and as it was beastly, and therefore did not perceive what was worthy of honor. In other words, they're acting like animals in a jungle, survival of the fittest. They don't know right from wrong, they just know survival. And when you only are about survival, you, your standards go way down. 
it's, a, it's the epitome of living in a dark room with no light. You don't know what's right or wrong. You don't know what's a door and what's a window. Nothing makes sense because all that's there is darkness. This is kind of what Jude is referencing. Calvin wrote that these men, they so feared not to condemn things above their comprehension. In other words, they had to comprehend anything. And anything they couldn't comprehend, they rejected. They also labored under another evil. For when like beasts, they were carried away to those things which gratified the senses of their body. They observed no moderation, but gorged themselves excessively like the swine that rolled around in the mud. This is again a reference to the sensuality and the, the egocentric action of self-centered men. Self-centered men don't think about anybody else. They don't think about others. They don't think about the future. They just think about the moment and they think about themselves. And this is what we see Jude referencing here. Calvin noted that the adverb naturally used by Jude set in opposition it was set in opposition to reason and judgment. Jude is referencing that the instinct of nature alone rules animals. Animals alone react in a survival mode all the time. They don't reason, they don't think, they're not encouraged, and they don't encourage, which is in itself an egocentric response, not rooted in reason, which ought to govern men and to bridle their appetites, but rooted in survival. Men ought to be rooted by logic, morality, and a concern for others. They ought to be humble and, ser and servants. That's what God made them to be. But they can only do that aligned with him. Those who reject God, God leaves them with their man-made superstition. He leaves them in their isolation. That is the ultimate experience of being isolated from God. You are in the ultimate experience of being alone. You are in a dark room with four walls, no door and no window. You are alone. And you don't know right from wrong. This is what Jude was referencing when he talked about superstitious isolation. So here we see in this passage, Jude is addressing the fate of those who are false teachers. He is addressing the fate of those who purposely walk away from God. In review, we see these four fates. They are reserved for those who reject God. Earthly destruction, heavenly rejection, the immediate consequences of sin as we, that we see in Sodom and Gomorrah and superstitious isolation. Are we not seeing this play out before our eyes at the present time? Are we not seeing this in culture every day? So the question is, what is our response to this? I leave you with Jeremiah 17, 7 and 8. Let's read this, pat, this these two verses together because these two verses represent our response our response to the culture we see today. But blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream. It does not fear when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. This is our response. <clears throat> we are blessed because we trust in the Lord, but we must trust totally in confidence with him. In other words, we must be in the word of God. We must be worshiping with other believers. We must be held accountable by brothers and sisters in Christ. We have to be totally in to who God is and he has to be our confidence. And if he is, we will be like this tree planted by water, which is a direct reference to Psalm 1. We will have deep roots. We will have a constant supply of water. We won't fear the heat or the storm and our leaves will always be green and we will always bear fruit. The culture doesn't determine our fate, God does. But we must root ourselves in who God is and not worry as much about who the culture is. This is our response to the culture. This is our response to the false teaching because we, just like Jude, find false teachers in our mix. We find churches that not uh, orient with God. We find churches rejecting parts of scripture. Their issue is their issue. Our issue is we need to be found deeply rooted in who God is. So this concludes our lesson for today. Please join me as we uh, close in prayer and prepare our hearts for worship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for who you are and what you are and how you have claimed us to be part of your kingdom. Father, use these words to penetrate our hearts, to change us more like you. Protect us from what we see out in the world. Make us not succumb to the world, but make us continue to, to make you our confidence. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.